Hi everyone, Michael here, Vegan Space Scientist. Today I'm going to be talking about whether it would be good or bad if humanity went extinct, let's say tomorrow. I think most people who have thought about this question for more than a few moments have come to the conclusion that it would definitely be bad, but there are some people who also I know who have come to the conclusion that it would definitely be good. I think there are relatively few people who seem to be a little bit less sure. I would include myself to be among those who are less sure because I can think of a lot of factors that are acting in both directions here. So a lot of things that would make it good if humanity went extinct and a lot of things that would make it bad if humanity went extinct. So really to come to a proper conclusion about whether it would be good or bad on balance, we need to be looking at all of these different things and trying to weigh them up. Quick philosophical disclaimer, I am a total hedonic utilitarian, so most conclusions I come to will be drawing on that quite heavily, most likely. So if you disagree with anything I'm saying, uh, keep in mind it might be that you're disagreeing on some probabilities or some facts, or it might just be that you're disagreeing with me on my underlying philosophy. Important to keep that in mind as we go through because I think it's important to make sure we know where we're disagreeing. Having said that, I will do my best to try and give some weight to some other philosophical arguments, uh, which is a little bit different to some other videos I do, I guess, where I just take hedonic utilitarianism for granted and run with that. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about how some other philosophical views might see this question perhaps differently. So I will say as well, I'm going to be talking about terraforming quite a bit. That's the idea of turning another planet, say Mars, into one with a livable, breathable atmosphere, uh, so one that we can live on the surface of without needing, say, spacesuits and habitats. So for example with Mars, altering its atmosphere to be something that we can breathe. This is mostly just because I'm a space scientist, that's a particular area of interest and expertise for me, and it's something I've written about before, both as part of my PhD and independently. A couple more things before we kick off. So first is this concept of existential risk, which is an event or scenario which might lead to the extinction of either human life or all life on Earth or perhaps all life in the universe or something like that. I'm going to briefly mention a few examples of existential risk, but I'm not going to spend too much time convincing you that they are likely or that we should be thinking about them. Personally, I think they are both likely and worthy of consideration, but this is not the point of this video, so if that's a sticking point for you, then keep that in mind, or I'll leave some links below for you to have a look at. Same again with wild animal suffering. I'll quickly mention what that is and explain it, but I'm not going to be trying to convince you of the worthiness of that argument, so again, links below. Okay, so the first thing to be thinking about here when we say, is the extinction of humanity going to be good or bad? If you think that most humans have net positive lives, which means they're better off being alive than not, then I think it's pretty trivial to say that extinction of humanity, as in all humans dying tonight, would be a bad thing. However, if we want to bring future lives into the consideration, even if we're just talking about future human lives, that really changes the dynamic quite a bit. Consider that human population is increasing over time, but even if it wasn't and say it remained stable or even decreased a little bit, the number of lives we'd expect to see in the future is far greater than the number of lives that are alive today or have even existed in the past, inclusive of today. But why should we care about these lives? There's a thesis that I would highly recommend by Nick Beckstead in 2013 called On the Overwhelming Importance of Shaping the Far Future. I'd recommend that quite strongly because it's actually really accessible for a philosophy thesis. Uh, maybe they get a bit of a bad rap sometimes, but theses and philosophy writing in general has a reputation for being a little bit hard to read. And I think at least some of that is warranted. I am writing a thesis myself, and so I completely understand that. Having said that, this is a really good introduction to that concept of why we should care about lives in the future. I think it's probably fair to say that a lot of people have varying degrees of concern for people in the future. So, for example, a lot of concern about climate change is related to future generations. Some of it's about people who are alive today, but a lot of it is because of uh, how climate change is going to affect people who aren't even alive today. There are people who think about that. But I think there would be some people who would feel a little bit less sure about trying to improve the lives of people who are going to live a million years from now, or a billion years from now. Now, of course, knowing what we can do today to positively influence the lives of people a billion years from now, let alone influence it all, is pretty uncertain. Fine, fair enough. But I want to bring you along with me on this acceptance of saying, if there was something that we could do to positively influence their lives, and we knew what that was, with some degree of certainty, then we should do it. So, just a little toy example that I like to give for why we should care about lives that don't yet exist at all. So imagine if someone set off a bomb in a childcare centre with children the age of six. This is quite clearly terrible. But now imagine if we place a time bomb in a childcare centre where there are only children age six at any given time. Let's make this 
thought experiment quite simple and clear and say that there are no adults present at any given time and say that someone places a time bomb and sets it to go off in 10 years. Now, the children who this is going to affect are not alive yet. Should that matter? And should that mean that it's not morally bad to place that time bomb there? My rationale, at least through utilitarianism, would be that this creates suffering and suffering is bad, and it doesn't matter that the suffering is going to occur at some time in the future. That suffering is not any less morally worthy than suffering today. Okay, so we've talked about why sentience and suffering and well-being in the future is morally relevant. Let's talk about an extension of that from Nick Bostrom. It's from his 2003 paper called Astronomical Waste, The Opportunity Cost of Delayed Technological Development. I'll have the abstract on screen here and just read it out. With very advanced technology, a very large population of people living happy lives could be sustained in the accessible region of the universe. For every year that development of such technologies and colonization of the universe is delayed, there is therefore an opportunity cost. A potential good, lives worth living, is not being realized. Given some plausible assumptions, this cost is extremely large. However, the lesson for utilitarians is not that we ought to maximize the pace of technological development, but rather that we ought to maximize its safety. So that is the probability that colonization will eventually occur. So what Bostrom is getting at here is that given the sheer amount of resources in our universe that we could access to spread, say, sentience, human lives in particular, I think he's referring to here, we have an obligation to try and bring about this reality of a world where there are trillions of lives experiencing lives worth living, experiencing net positive lives. So I'd certainly be willing to accept that, as long as they are net positive lives. Then we should be trying to bring about this reality uh, faster and make sure it happens, increasing the likelihood of its occurrence. So how do we do that? One way we can do that is by reducing the risk of any existential threats. So when I say existential threat, there are a few different definitions of this. The definition I use is it's some event that could uh, threaten the extinction of all human life or all life in general, whether it's all life on Earth or life, all life through the universe, as I said. I think often when people refer to existential threats, they're talking about humans specifically. Definitely not always the case, but I think it's fair to say that that is often the case. Some examples of these kind of events, there's, I guess, two categories. There's natural and there's uh, artificial. So natural events might be a major asteroid or comet impact, a supervolcano eruption, or say a natural uh, pandemic. And then there are the artificial existential threats. So things like artificial engineered pandemics or global nuclear warfare, or perhaps extreme climate change if it's so much worse than our models predicted. These events are all capable of destroying all human life on Earth. Now, there's a difference between a catastrophic threat and an existential threat. Catastrophic threat is one that might cause catastrophic damage, so say, maybe a smaller asteroid or comet, or a pandemic that's quite bad but still doesn't quite wipe out all human life. So thinking about this concept of astronomical waste, and sometimes it's called cosmic endowment, which is the potential for well-being if we spread it through the universe. Catastrophic threats are of course bad in a utilitarian sense in the short term, but they don't necessarily reduce the likelihood of achieving the cosmic endowment. They may well do, but not necessarily. However, an existential threat, if we destroy all human life, then that does say, at least for it to be brought about by humans, eliminate the possibility of the cosmic endowment. So if it were the case that the future is going to be net good if we can achieve it and get to this realization of cosmic endowment, then of course, these existential threats are going to stop us from achieving that. And that would be bad from a utilitarian perspective. However, if there was a possibility that the future might not be net good, that there was some other scenario other than this cosmic endowment, that if humanity survived, we might reach that less good scenario. If there was even a possibility of that, then that forces us to consider what if the future is not net good if humanity survives. Let me talk now about some reasons why I think this may be the case, or at least let me talk about some factors that would be acting in that direction. First, farmed animal suffering. There are around 80 billion land animals who are farmed each year, most of whom experience unimaginable suffering in factory farms. Consider the trillions of marine animals as they're killed by humans in fishing and hunting each year. While there has been some progress in the animal rights movement, there is no guarantee that at some point in the future we will eliminate this. There's no guarantee that it's going to get smaller. I would like to hope so, and I think we are slowly trending in that direction, but there's no guarantee. Now you have to admit that Human extinction would mean there are no more animals suffering in these farms. I think we can chalk that up to a point being in favour of human extinction. 
I'm going to talk about terraforming and space colonization in a moment, but for now, imagine that we do spread to other planets, other star systems, maybe even other galaxies in hundreds of thousands or millions of years. If we haven't stopped farming animals by that point, that is a lot of planets that we could be filling with farmed animal suffering. Now what about wild animal suffering? As I said, I'm not going to talk too much about the argument here. In short, it's the case that nature is full of suffering, independent of human intervention. The life of a wild animal is probably quite terrible on average, whether they're being eaten alive, or cold, or hungry, or have a parasite, or have a disease. I wouldn't wish the life of an average wild animal, especially when you include insects, on anybody. That sounds like a terrible fate. Now there are two steps of the wild animal suffering argument. One is that you recognise that this suffering is bad. From a utilitarian perspective, there should be no reason why suffering is any less worthy of consideration just because it's not caused by humans. The next part of that is, well, what do we do about it, if anything? So some people might say, if there is something we could do about it safely to reduce the suffering of wild animals, then we should absolutely do it. We have an obligation to do it from a utilitarian perspective, where other people might say, well, it's bad that they're suffering, but we shouldn't be obliged to do anything about it. I put myself in the first camp. If there is something we can do about it, then we should. There's a lot to unpack in that subject there, and again, this video is not intended to cover it all. Uh, I have some links below that will do that further. So I'm going to assume that you're at least partially with me on this point. Now here's where it gets interesting. I think even for people who say that we shouldn't do anything to try and prevent wild animal suffering, even if they agree that it is bad, I wonder whether they would accept that we should not, therefore, be spreading wild animal suffering to other planets. Would they think that that is bad? And I don't know the answer because obviously oh, that's not my mindset, but I am curious and uh, very interested to hear what people think on, in the comments below if they are of that persuasion. Uh, do you think that spreading wild animal suffering to Mars would be bad if you think that we shouldn't do anything about it on Earth? Do you think it would be neutral? Do you think it would be good? So if humanity goes extinct, then we will never spread wild animal suffering to other planets. Now suppose that it is only humans that go extinct. It's not all life on Earth that goes extinct. We should expect wild animal suffering to continue pretty much unabated on Earth. Given the possibility for us to do something about wild animal suffering on Earth in the future and to mitigate it, reduce it, maybe even eliminate it at some point in the far future, then if only humans go extinct, then this would be, you could maybe say, better because of the farmed animal suffering being eliminated, but it wouldn't be the optimum scenario because there is still net animal suffering on Earth, in my view. If all life on Earth went extinct, then that would be a different question because that wild animal suffering would also have been eliminated. So let's come back to terraforming. As I said, it's the concept of making the atmosphere and surface of another planet livable without the need for habitats and spacesuits and so on. So often when people think about terraforming, they're thinking about Mars, but there's no reason why it is exclusively limited to Mars. We could look at it also for, say, Venus, some other planet or moon in the solar system. Uh, and maybe even planets from other star systems, if we were able to get to other star systems and look at terraforming those. Now when I'm looking at terraforming, I'm of course thinking about whether it be good or bad from a utilitarian perspective. Some people who have written about terraforming use a different ethical code to say whether it would be good or bad. So for example, McKay 1990 says that it would be unethical to terraform Mars if we discovered microbial life on it. I can't think of a utilitarian argument for why this would be the case, except Maybe we'd miss out on a research opportunity if we were to, say, contaminate the surface of the planet with life from Earth. And Zubrin 2011 says, and I quote, I would say that a failure to terraform Mars constitutes a failure to live up to human nature and a betrayal of our responsibility as members of the community of life itself. But even for most of those who do make a utilitarian argument, they're thinking mostly about how the utility applies to humans, for example, McKay 2007. Many people in my field of space science think that terraforming would be definitely good. There are some who think it would be uh, bad situationally, um, and maybe some even who think it would be bad because we just shouldn't be intervening in environments at all, whether it has life on it or not. But I'm much less certain that it would be good than the people in my community. So letting aside the fact that colonizing Mars would reduce our chance of succumbing to some existential threat, say if there was an asteroid that hit Earth, everyone on Earth dies, but some people on a Mars base survive and continue to propagate humanity back to Earth or on Mars or whatever. Letting that part aside, I'm also thinking about the more short-term effects of spreading whether farmed animal suffering to Mars or wild animal suffering to Mars. Wild animal suffering, you might think, is surely quite some time off on Mars. We first have to terraform the planet, and then we'd have to make the decision to bring wild animals to the surface of Mars. It depends on them being able to adapt to the environment, and so on. 
That's true, but I think terraforming might be a little bit closer than some people think. Some people talk about the surface of Mars being partially livable, say, without a spacesuit, anywhere from about 500 years to maybe 100,000 years. And I think we should definitely be thinking about these time frames. But even on a shorter time frame than that, let me give you an example. Yamashita et al. 2009 talked about the promise of using insects in the terraforming process itself. So as agents for doing the terraforming work, such as converting some of the gases from one source to another or to release gas from some solid or liquid material. Tomasic in 2016 estimates that the number of insects currently living on Earth is somewhere from 10 to the power of 17 to 10 to the power of 19. That's an enormous number. Look at the zeros below to get a sense. If we take this insect density on Earth as an upper bound, given that the surface area of Mars is about 83% of the surface area of Earth, or the land surface area at least, we could have potentially close to the same number of insects on Mars as we do on Earth today. And if we are looking at using insects during the terraforming process before the atmosphere is breathable for humans, then we could have insects to a significant degree on Mars relatively soon, maybe in the next few hundred years. If you accept the wild animal suffering argument even partially, then this would be very bad indeed. And for the final reason why I think the future might not be good if we were to survive all the existential threats is digital sentience. So in part I'm talking about artificial gender intelligence, and of course if they're sentient then surely they would have some moral worth, but also I'm thinking about any digital sentiences that are less, say, general and advanced as an AGI and maybe just capable of doing some amount of work, but still being sentient to some degree. Imagine if we use these digital sentiences to do a lot of computational work. We could imagine that we would exploit them and that we wouldn't necessarily give much consideration to their suffering and to their well-being. Humanity tends to be throughout history pretty good at exploiting others, whether it's those in our own species or of other species. And so I don't know if digital sentience would necessarily be that different. If we were to propagate humanity through the galaxy, then we could imagine a lot of digital sentences could be suffering as well. Let's talk a little bit about antinatalism. In short, what I call hard antinatalism, at least, is the idea that it is always a harm to the individual to bring them into existence. An extension of this may well be that the fact that life arose at all was bad, and that it is wrong to have children, it is wrong to procreate, and that existential threat may be good. Not all antinatalists would necessarily think this, but I think it's fair to say that many would. Now, hard antinatalism doesn't seem to be compatible with total hedonic utilitarianism, because the idea that it is always a harm to be brought into existence relies a little bit on this asymmetry of bringing about new suffering being bad, but bringing about new pleasure not being bad, because if you do not bring about new lives experiencing pleasure, there is no one around to lament its lack of existence of this pleasure, because the individual doesn't exist at all. Whereas with suffering, it would be bad to bring uh, new suffering lives into existence. Now, I don't buy this asymmetry argument, and I think it's irrelevant as well for a total hedonic utilitarian perspective. And David Benatar, one of the leading proponents of an antinatalist view, admits this and says that this asymmetry argument is not compatible with total hedonic utilitarianism or, or even some other forms of utilitarianism. My view personally is of soft antinatalism, and I think this distinction between hard and soft was coined by... David Pierce, and soft antinatalism is that it's bad in general to bring new lives into existence today. So I'm not just thinking about the effect on the life that is brought about itself, uh, but also the effect, say, through resource drain or opportunity cost or environmental impact or something like that on the lives of other people who exist already. I've talked more about this in my recent video on why I don't want to have kids. So from a hard antinatalist perspective, an existential threat may be a good thing, but it wouldn't necessarily solve the problem of wild animal suffering. And I think it a hard antinatalist would almost certainly accept that the wild animal suffering is also bad. However, if an existential threat only affects humans, or even if humanity stops procreating and uh, becomes extinct through its own volition, as some people would advocate for, then that still doesn't solve this problem of wild animal suffering. There's also this idea of cosmic rescue missions, which was coined by David Pierce in 2004 in his work, The Hedonistic Imperative. This is the idea that at some point in the future, we might be able to visit other planets that have some wild animal suffering. Maybe these other planets don't have any advanced intelligent life, but they have some degree of wild animals suffering. Then we could do something to alleviate their suffering. I think this is a point in favor of human extinction being bad. However, I want to offer some counterpoints by Brian Tomasic. So first is that it's not obvious that there are that many planets out there. We 
with wild animal suffering on which we can alleviate the suffering. It's also unclear whether humans would even support these missions. Maybe humanity would just take a non-interventionist stance in the future. But, and I think this is the most compelling one for me at least, it's also more likely that we will actually spread wild animal suffering than reduce it. And the scale of spreading wild animal suffering would be greater than the scale we could reduce it. So say for example, let's, and this is just for sake of argument, pulling a number out of nowhere, Let's say 1 in 10,000 planets out there have life that we can reduce the suffering of. So the best case is that we prevent all this suffering. The worst case is that we spread wild animal suffering to the other 9,999 planets, and maybe we even spread farmed animal suffering and so on. So the cosmic rescue missions idea is nice, but when you think about it in context with the worst case scenario relating to wild animal suffering, I don't think it's worth it. So back to the question, on balance, would it be good or bad for humanity to go extinct? We talked about some points in favour of humanity going extinct in terms of utilitarianism and some points against. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. I've gone back and forth on this several times in the last four or five years, and I think right now I'm pretty close to being in the middle and I'm just very uncertain about whether humanity going extinct would be good or bad. Humanity going extinct would be bad for humans, but for all sentient life in general, I'm really not sure. At the very least, the point of this video is I want to really drive home that I think most people were just way overconfident in one direction or another. Most people, I think at least within, say, the effective altruism community, are pretty confident that human extinction would be bad. But I hope I've raised some points that at least make people think that maybe there's some things they're not considering. And for people who think humanity going extinct would definitely be good, I hope we've done the same and presented some points from the other side. I don't think many people have tried to really rigorously estimate the the sign or the, the net outcome of humanity not going extinct or even all life on Earth not going extinct, especially when you consider all of the non-human lives. To my knowledge at least, Brian Tomasic might be the only one who's even looked at this. The work of Nick Bostrom seems to focus mostly on human well-being and doesn't really consider non-human well-being, at least as far as I can tell. Now I've talked about some things that are going to happen a very, very long time from now, so what about if we just leave this problem for future generations to deal with and we can focus on the problems that we have today? Well, I, I don't think so. We definitely have some problems today and maybe you could argue that some of them are more pressing than some of the, the future issues. But if we take this view of suffering and well-being mattering, even if the lives that experience them don't exist yet, we have to be considering the impact that we have on those future lives right now. I think right now is actually maybe the best time to be influencing public opinion and policy on some issues like existential risks and terraforming, whether we should be doing terraforming, whether we should be colonizing space, and that kind of thing. Even if we disregard the probability of us going extinct in the next hundred years, we can still do a lot to positively impact the future. So this is why my focus has shifted over time from focusing on existential risk reduction to making sure that the future, if there is one for sentient life, is good and not terrible. So how do we do this? How do we meaningfully influence the future? How do we even know what our actions are going to do in terms of influencing the future? One way that I, that I like, which I think is a little bit clearer in terms of how we can influence the future, is values spreading. We can influence what people do in the future by spreading good values now and Hopefully, therefore, some of those values will be remaining in the future societies. One value in particular that comes to mind is that of concern for non-humans or expanding our moral circle in general. So if you think about over time, the fact that we've gone from only caring about people who live in our tribe, our village, to caring about people who live in our nation, to caring about all human races and genders and so on, to now we're starting to push the boundary and care about other species. Maybe we need to push that even further and care about digital sentience at some point. But I think we can say that spreading this value of concern for our other sentient minds is good. And I like the concept of sentientist, which is like a humanist, but for all sentient life. Another thing we might be able to meaningfully do to influence the future is altering the trajectory of humanity. So I'm going to read from my notes here. We're talking about speeding up or slowing down technological progress. This is not really a novel idea. Ostro and Sagan proposed doing this in the 90s in relation to dual use technologies like asteroid deflection techniques. See my video about a month or so ago on this. Um, they're talking about slowing down the development of certain technologies that might be used for either good or harm until we're more confident that we're not going to misuse them either intentionally or accidentally. So maybe we can apply that kind of thinking to technology in general. Now one might argue that any delay in human progress would be bad because it delays our cosmic endowment of spreading human flourishing across the galaxy. Uh, I note that Bostrom actually does recognise this, and he said it in the abstract I read out before in his 2003 paper. Delaying existential risk means that we should maximise the probability that cosmic endowment will actually occur, which that involves mitigating X risk. However, as I've said several times now, this assumes that the future is going to be net good for sentient life, which I'm a little bit less sure about, especially once we consider non-humans. 
So slowing down progress until we're a little bit more sure about this might be a good idea. What might this look like in a general case? I don't really know. It could just mean introducing policies to be more cautious about new technologies than we otherwise would be. In particular, we should be a lot more cautious about terraforming, and I think we should be really slowing it down in terms of colonizing and terraforming Mars. I've certainly changed my mind on this in the last few years, even. This might be a little bit strange to hear from someone who's doing a PhD in using geophysics to look at how we can support colonization, asteroid mining, deflection, and so on efforts in the future. Uh, I've changed my mind over the course of the PhD, and throughout my thesis I've been trying to encourage caution and make people think about some of these issues. So I think we'll wrap it up there. I hope this video hasn't been too unsatisfying. I know I didn't come to a strong conclusion because I do not have a strong conclusion. Mostly I wanted to get across this idea of you should be thinking about the pros and cons of this issue, as is a pretty common theme with what I talk about. So please leave any thoughts below. If there's anything I've missed, I'm very keen to read it and change my mind. Uh, let me know what you think. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Uh, dislike if you didn't because I value your feedback a lot. That's all I have. And please share the video if you think it was worthwhile watching. So thank you and we'll see you next time.